Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Tom, for this invitation to speak here this evening. It is a privilege to be with you um, on this opening night of this important conference. This is just the kind of conversation that we need to be having. Um, it's so exciting to see today's leaders in biblical scholarship and theology taking on the doctrine of creation and what it means in light of modern scientific discoveries. Um, as a scientist, I am so glad that your expertise is coming alongside to answer these questions, to wrestle with them together. So uh, for the good of the church, now I am not a theologian. You didn't hear any, I mean, you heard, of, I guess the word theology was somewhere in that introduction, but I am not a theology theologian by training. And in reading the papers for this conference, that was confirmed in my mind. Yes, I'm not a theologian. Um, I learned a lot from there, and I'm looking forward to learning more uh, during the course of this meeting. And um, I also look forward to hearing your feedback on this talk and the Q&A afterwards and uh, throughout the week. I, I would love your insights. Um, I'm coming to you tonight as an astronomer and a Christ follower. And I want to talk to you about Christ and the cosmos and how I see the discoveries of modern astronomy in light of Christian faith. Now, three discoveries I have in mind here, three uh, areas of Christ I have in mind here are the glory of Christ, the goodness of Christ, and the grace of Christ. It's a classic outline. Um, my pastor used it a few months ago, and it just stuck with me. Now, you may be wondering, what in the world does astronomy have to do with these key concepts of our Christian faith? Well, I'm not intending here tonight to start from the natural world and from that attempt to prove something about Christianity, to prove the existence of God. I want to go the other direction, following in uh, the pattern of Alistair McGrath and others, to start from the Christian faith and from there look at the physical world and look through, looking through that lens to see what becomes clear. Um, as the papers have shown, a few of them have, have shown this very well, starting from the Christian faith is a wonderful foundation for the project of doing science. And when we do it then, we are discovering things about God's creation. And far from finding that science contradicts faith or disproves God, instead we find that science actually is showing us things that resonate with our Christian faith and enhance our understanding of God. So those are the kinds of things I want to show you today. So to start, I want you to think back to a time when you were outside on a clear, dark night. Maybe you looked up at the city lights and saw the moon rising over the city. Maybe you were out in the country and you looked out and you saw the sky filled with sparkling stars. Maybe you looked up and you saw the band of the Milky Way or even a meteor, a shooting star. Do you remember what that felt like? I think everybody has that wonderful sense of awe and wonder when they look up at the night sky, a sense that you're be ta being taken beyond your everyday worries um, to something that's beyond yourself. Now, we as Christians, though, don't have just a generic sense of awe. We actually experience it on yet another level because we know that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the skies are proclaiming the work of his hands. We know that the universe didn't just arise out of nothing or arise from an impersonal force. We know that there is a person behind the universe, a person who knows us and who longs to be known. And that person is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word, and through him all things were made. What does it mean for our understanding of creation to see Christ as the creator? So one thing it means is that the heavens are declaring the glory of Christ. So that's one of the themes I want to start with today, and then we'll get to the goodness of Christ and the grace of Christ. Now. I've heard some people say that scientists take the wonder and joy out of things. That they just take all the data and analyze it to death, they reduce it down to a bit, bits and pieces and uh, add a whole bunch of mathematics, which is boring and dull and difficult, and then there's no more fun left. <laughs> well, that is not my experience at all. I will admit to analyzing data, that part I like. Um, in fact, that's one of my favorite parts of doing research. 
I had the privilege of using this telescope, the Very Large Array Radio Telescope in New Mexico, for many years. I used it to study galaxy clusters and the curvature of space. And my papers, you would probably find pretty dull and challenging and so forth. Uh, here's one of my, my latest paper there. Um, so, but the people in my field, of course, we love this stuff. We find it really fascinating. Um, this was a paper on galaxy clusters, and I found myself developing my favorite galaxy clusters. And I'm not alone. I have met biologists who have their favorite protein. Okay. I have met a paleontologist who has her favorite bone in the body. I was just reading a chemist who was going on and on about how cool phosphorus is. It turns out to be really key for biological processes. I didn't know. So for scientists, a scientific explanation does not detract from our wonder and joy and enthusiasm. It adds to it as we learn more about science. So I want to share that with you today. I feel that is part of my calling as a Christian and a scientist to share with the church the discoveries of science and so that we can all be praising God for these things. So let's start by looking at this star cluster. Is it coming through well? Yeah, yeah. oh good, good. Um, isn't it beautiful? It, you can see all of these shining stars in uh, red and blue and yellow and white and they're just shining forth brilliantly. Um, astronomers will call this a jewel box of stars. And it's easy here to see the shining glory of God, the shining glory of Jesus Christ. In scripture, we don't often see the shining glory of Jesus Christ. We do like in the transfiguration. Um, but here in the universe that Christ made, this glory is shining out brilliantly. Now, what do we learn about this when we consider it scientifically? Well, for one thing, I can tell you what the colors are due to. They're due to the uh, temperature of the stars. The bluer stars are hotter and the redder stars are cooler, although still very hot, thousands of degrees, but cooler than the blue ones. And by learning about the temperature and the luminosity of these stars, we can start to deduce other things, like the mass of the stars. And then you throw in a bunch of uh, sophisticated physics and you can start to learn about the age of the stars. So we learn that the stars, the um, very luminous blue stars, are very short-lived. They don't last very long. They burn up quickly. So uh, let's consider two star clusters. So this image here shows two star clusters in the same frame. One of them is a bit in the foreground, uh, and the other's in the background. So the one on the left um, is a little bit larger and brighter because it's in the foreground. Um, but you can also see a color difference. So. Uh, which one is more blue, the one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the left. Now, remember what I said, the blue stars are short-lived. So that means that the blue cluster there is actually younger. Those blue stars are still there. The one on the right is more yellow, white, reddish stars. That's because all the blue ones have burned out. They're not there anymore. So that one on the right is an older cluster. And here are the ages. Uh, the one on the left is 150 million years old, and the one on the right is 1.5 billion years old. So those are some pretty long numbers of years. Uh, if I had heard those when I was a child growing up, I would have rejected that as false and anti-God. I grew up in a wonderful Christian home and a great church that taught me to love Jesus and to um, care about bringing the gospel to the world. And we all believed that the earth was young because we didn't know of any other Christian position you could have. It was either a young earth or atheism. And then when I got to graduate school, well, then I had to really start to wrestle with this because um, I was starting to become scientifically interested in studying astronomy, but I had the same choice as uh, the story that Tom told earlier. But for me, I think I would have not gone into science if, if I had not found a resolution to that. So I was going to hang on to the Bible. I did not want to say, oh, this part of the Bible, we'll just ignore that or water that down. No, all of the Bible is God's authoritative word to us, inspired and useful for our lives. So I was so blessed to come across some good biblical scholars. Um, the first one I read was John Steck at Calvin Seminary. And I learned for the first time about the ancient context in which Genesis was written. And I learned about 
um, what that meant in a pre-scientific culture. And it changed my understanding completely. I felt like I understood better what God's intent was in this passage, what God was teaching us, and I could see how I could uphold the authority of God's word and uh, accept what God is showing us in the natural world, in his creation, God's word and God's world. Now, I know that we are not all in this room going to agree about these things, um, uh, about what we think about the age of the universe in Genesis 1, um, about evolution. There's a lot we're going to disagree about. But um, I was also, like Tom, thinking of that opening session from last year when Pastor Greg Waybright talked about intellectual humility and intellectual hospitality. That phrase really stuck with me. And that's what we're here to do, is to listen to each other, learn from each other, better understand why people hold a different view. What is the evidence they're looking at? What are the arguments that are powerful them? What weaknesses do they see in my view? Um, Biologus has been in a project doing that with a group of people from Reasons to Believe and with a group of Southern Baptist scholars who are here today. And our book is just out, so sorry for a little shameless promotion there, but um, check out the book table because it's like I just saw it for the first time tonight. Um, and in that book, we seek to have a gracious dialogue between people who disagree about these issues to better understand each other. All right, so uh, moving on, I want to show you then a little bit more about what we're seeing of the glory of Christ in one of these star clusters. So I've got a uh, movie here. So in this animation, we're going to get to travel into a star cluster. And it is surrounded by a cloud, a beautiful nebula. So we're going to fly past these nearby stars and get closer and closer to this cloud of gas and dust. Now, the different colors here are due to different types of gases. Um, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen are glowing different colors in the light of these stars. And as we get closer, you can see there's these fingers of um, darker material. This, those are fingers of denser dust. And at the end of each is a clump. And inside of that clump is a little cocoon where a new star is forming. There are new stars being born in this cluster, adding on to the thousands that are already here. There's about 3,000 stars so far formed. And more are being formed all the time. And thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope for that image and the video and to NASA. Now, what is going on in those clumps at the end of the fingers there? Well, it's the swirling cloud of gas and dust. And it's very diffuse initially. But under gravity, the force of gravity, this material collapses down. And it gets more concentrated. And clumps come together. And it's still kind of a swirly mess. But eventually, enough clumps together that uh, it becomes massive enough and dense enough that fusion turns on. And once fusion turns on, a new star is born. And what's left behind is a disk of material orbiting around it. And in that disk of material, that coalesces together to form planets. So what I'm telling you here is in this beautiful nebula, new stars and new planets are being formed. God is still creating. And this is a question I'd actually love to hear more from theologians and biblical scholars on. What we're learning from astronomy is that creation is not a once and done thing. God is continually developing the universe. We can see the history of it. Um, it's an ever-growing complexity. And the theological idea that um, God's creative work and God's providential work are different, well, here in astronomy, they sure look like the same thing. So God is working continually to create and to uh, uphold and care for his creation. So I'd love to hear what the theological implications of that are. A little challenge for you. All right, so that's the glory of creation, showing us the glory of Christ and the beauty of the night sky in the brilliance of a star cluster and his ongoing creative work in beautiful nebula like this. All right, so now I will turn to my next point, the goodness of Christ. Now, here's one thing I learned from theologians, that when, um, oh, but before I get to that, um, we're going to talk a lot more at this conference about goodness and natural evil on uh, Saturday. There's a whole session devoted to that, especially in the context of evolution. And those are some very challenging questions and very important ones. That's going to be an important session. What I want to do tonight is not address life and uh, humans at all, 
but instead just talk about the physical world and does that give us any insights into the goodness of creation? So one thing I've learned from theologians is that when Genesis 1, when God says, and it was good, what's that goodness talking about? Well, not moral goodness, it's more fitness to purpose. Um, that goodness is that which supports and fulfills God's intention for flourishing. All right, well, um, part of flourishing is abundance. And I'm reminded here of some of uh, Jesus' miracles. In feeding the 5,000, um, he breaks the loaves and the fishes, and he doesn't just feed 50 people, he feeds 5,000. It's just there's this extravagant abundance. Or uh, in turning water into wine, he could have made a few bottles. He made like 150 gallons of wine. There's an abundance to God's creativity and extravagance to it. And I see it all over the universe. The, this beautiful nebula I've been showing you, it's one of thousands in our galaxy and many more in the universe beyond. Um, far more than we uh, were even able to observe until we invented a telescope and we couldn't make pictures like this till a few decades ago. There's so much to discover in this abundant creation and that seems to me to speak of God's goodness. Now, uh, there's more to this though. How is the universe fit for flourishing? And I wanna talk here about the argument for fine tuning. So um, I, I've got kind of step by step here of this argument. To be fit for flourishing, the universe first has to, at a minimum, allow for simple life to exist. So I'm not talking even here about intelligent life or animal life, let's just go with bacteria, okay? What does the universe need in order for a bacteria to live? Well, it needs a few basic things. It needs a stable energy source. Um, a nice long-lived star would be good for that. And you need a variety of atoms. If you only had hydrogen in the universe, you wouldn't be able to make much of anything interesting. We need some variety. So where do atoms come from? Well, atoms are formed in the cores of stars. So uh, that means the universe needs to be such that we can have stars form. All right, so I just described to you how stars form. Uh, but think about the role of gravity here. I said that this cloud collapses under gravity. What if the force of gravity weren't strong enough? Well, that cloud would never condense down. It would just be a puffy ball of gas and dust, and you would never have a star form. The force of gravity needs to be strong enough for that. What if the force of gravity were too weak? Well, I said, okay, what if it was too strong? I already said how it was too weak. What if the force of gravity were too strong? Well, then it would definitely collapse. Yeah, you would get a new star forming, certainly. Uh, but it turns out it would burn up really quickly. So when you get very high mass, high density stars, they just are a flash in the pan. So it's not the kind of stable energy source you really want. So the force of gravity has to be just right. It can't be too much or too small or you would not have stars, which means you would not have the variety of atoms you need, which means you couldn't have life. And this is just one of several parameters in the universe that are fine-tuned for life. What's telling us is that God created the universe to make it a good and fitting home for us. It couldn't be here unless God had set several parameters right from the beginning. And that speaks to us of God's craftsmanship, as in, uh, described in Proverbs 8, God's design. Um, this argument here is something that Al Plantinga, in his book, uh, Where the Conflict Really Lies, describes as a design discourse. Um, this isn't a, a proof or a, a formal logical argument, but it's more of a perception, a recognition that, wow, the universe is really well suited for life and that speaks to us of a designer who made it. And it speaks of the goodness of God's creation, the fittingness of it. Now, studying the universe, though, also helps point out a few things that goodness is not. So I'll talk about three of these. So first, um, we see in the universe that in a good universe, you can have things that are not immortal, things, nothing I see in the universe lasts forever. Stars are, live for billions of years, but stars also die. And here is a video that shows this. This is an animation from the European Space Agency. And we're gonna see uh, an artist drawing here of a star near the end of its life. 
and it dies in a huge supernova explosion. For a while, that explosion is brighter than a billion stars. And then the debris slowly expands away from the explosion, and it creates a nebula that we can still see today. This particular nebula, the Crab Nebula, is about 1,000 years old. And uh, we can still see that debris expanding. So that was a really violent explosion. OK, this is not a safe or tame thing. If one of these went off near the Earth at a nearby star, that would not be good. OK? So this is a dangerous thing. So goodness does not mean safe or tame. Um, goodness can be wild, like the wild places of Earth, like uh, Mount Everest or Death Valley. These are not comfortable places to be, and yet they're, they're part of God's good creation and have the beauty and glory all their own. In Job, uh, God claims ownership of the wild things of this world, even the dangerous things. So creation can be good without being safe, and creation can be good without being immortal. Third, creation can be good without being predictable. So creation is filled with order. Oh, I love the mathematical order of creation. This is one reason I went into physics. You can map it at this, this that the mathematics describe what's going on in the universe. It's just incredible. But in addition to that order, there are also these elements of unpredictability, of randomness. Now, that randomness doesn't mean it's meaningless or purposeless. It just means it's unpredictable. So let's consider snowflakes. OK, that's a really weird thing to do on an incredibly hot day with a summer thunderstorm going by. OK, but this is what I had planned. So OK, snowflakes. Um, so here they are. And aren't they beautiful? We love snowflakes for their order, for that six-sided symmetry. There's a beautiful order to that. But the other thing we love about snowflakes, they're all unique. Each one's different. How did that happen? Well, through randomness, through the unpredictable motions of the snowflake as it's dancing around through the atmosphere coming down to Earth, it causes each one to be unique. So I've come to see God as using randomness intentionally. There's a purposeful randomness of using it in order to bring about the variety that God intends, all bounded by the orderliness of creation. So astronomy, um, I think, seems to be saying that creation can be good without being eternal or safe or predictable. But as C.S. Lewis showed us, Aslan is not a tame lion, even though he's good. All right, so moving on to my third point, the grace of Christ. Now, this is where the second member of the Trinity gives us some particular insights. What does it mean to think of creation as something made by Jesus Christ? the one who took on our flesh, who died for our sins, in this ultimate act of the um, self-giving love of God. And that love is part of everything that God does and how God relates to us. Um, God goes out of his way to be loving and even respectful of the integrity of the things that he has made. It, it permeates everything. Everything is about God's relationship with us, working in us and through us at our pace. Consider how Jesus commissioned the disciples. Um, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Jesus put the future of the church in the hands of some very weak and imperfect people. He put it in the hands of the disciples. He put it in our hands. And that's pretty daunting. So Christ does not use brute force or raw power, but instead doesn't seem to be in a hurry, doesn't seem to be worried about efficiency but puts this priority in working in us and through us. OK, so that's a bunch of theological language. But I actually see that going on in that star cluster I've been showing you, where these stars are forming. God is working very slowly over millions of years. God is working with the natural materials that are there, uh, with the materials he's previously created. He's using the natural laws. It isn't about efficiency. He isn't getting Every single star that could be formed is not formed here. A lot of stuff doesn't form into stars. God has the authority and power. He could have snapped his fingers and poof, there would be a new star cluster. God totally could have done that. But he didn't. He decided to instead work with his creation in partnership with what he created. But it's no less God's work. 
All right, for my next example of where I see grace uh, in, in astronomy, um, let's step a bit further out into the universe. So here's a picture of a galaxy. And if you've ever heard me talk before, you know that I love galaxies. They're so beautiful, especially ones like this. This is a, a spiral galaxy. This is Andromeda, one of the um, nearest galaxies to the Milky Way and quite similar to the Milky Way. Do you see the blue color there? That's from those hot, short-lived stars that I was talking about. They're making the whole galaxy blue. Now, a galaxy like this has a few hundred billion stars in it and is a few hundred thousand light years across. We also have elliptical galaxies, and so I've studied these in my research. This is a giant elliptical. It's probably a thousand times the mass of the, uh, the other one, of the spiral galaxy. And uh, it doesn't have the spiral arms. It's a big, puffy uh, ball. It doesn't have those blue stars either. It has mostly older stars. So as you can tell, I could go on and give you multiple lectures all about what galaxies are. The thing is, as much as we know about them, there's still a lot we don't know. Uh, we know that they have a lot of dark matter in them. Uh, there's about 10 times as much dark matter as the matter that you see here that's emitting light. Dark matter is stuff that it has mass, but it's invisible. It doesn't interact with light. It doesn't give off light. So we know it's there, but we don't know what it is. <laughs> it's probably some weird kind of elementary particle, but we really haven't figured it out. We know something but there is still so much more that we don't know. In fact, this applies to the universe as a whole. Uh, about 5% of the universe is atoms. Atoms, that's all the stuff in this room, the air we breathe, everything in the periodic table, everything studied by chemists, pretty much everything I've told you about in this lecture is all atoms. But that's only 5% of the stuff in the universe. There's another uh, quarter of the universe that's this dark matter that we don't know what it is, and another 70% or so that's dark energy. That's weird stuff. Some weird kind of energy or force that's causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. And we don't know what that is either. There's still so much more to be known. And that's one of the joys of doing science, is that there's always more questions. We love new questions in science. Now, this also, though, reminds me of encountering God. Paul says, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. There is so much about God that we don't fully understand. There's the joy of always learning more about God as we walk with him, as we study him. And yet, Jesus said, if you know me, you've seen the Father. Everything that we really need to know about God we have seen in Jesus Christ. And that is an incredible statement of God's grace to us. Um, in Christ, we see the self-giving love of God, and that's the most important thing for us to learn. And yet, there is always more to discover. All right, so for my final point, I want to talk to you about how astronomy gives us a picture of the magnitude of God's forgiveness, of Christ's grace. So uh, consider this field in the sky. Uh, there's the moon to scale compared to these stars, and there's that square at the bottom. That's XDF, for extreme deep field, and it's a little patch of sky that the Hubble Space Telescope uh, chose to investigate very thoroughly. Uh, they took thousands of photographs over many weeks and added them all together. They picked a spot in the sky that you can see it looks empty. It doesn't have any bright stars in it. There's no galaxies in it. It just looks empty. But when they had this incredibly sensitive, deep image. Here's what they found. Thousands of galaxies filling that whole space. It's not empty at all. That little patch of the sky, that little postage stamp, is representative of the whole sky. This is the wallpaper of the universe. Every little patch of sky is filled like this. It might look black in the background, but when you dig into it, you find that it is filled with an incredible richness. Each of these galaxies has hundreds of billions of stars in it. You can see all the different kinds here. There's blue ones and yellow ones. You can see the elliptical ones, the spiral ones. Um, I like to think of God having this sort of view of the universe, of seeing all of the galaxies laid out before him. 
but it also makes us feel pretty tiny, because we really are tiny compared to the universe. So uh, if you just picture we're just a tiny part of one of those galaxies. So what does that mean for who we are? Well, one answer to that uh, comes here from Carl Sagan, who was uh, an astronomer, a great educator, and he also had an atheistic worldview. And when looking at the universe through that lens, he said, who are we? We find that we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star, lost in a galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe. Wow, insignificant, forgotten. This is not what we see when we look through the Christian lens. But if you start with an atheistic lens, this is the conclusion you come to. When we look through the eyes of faith, we see a different picture. Psalm 103 says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, as vast as this universe is, and it doesn't say, oh, you're so small and puny. It says, as vast as the universe is, so great is God's love. And as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. God's saying this vast universe, it's there to teach us about the vastness of God's love. He invites us to picture our sins being forgiven and removed to the ends of the universe. It's a picture of God's grace. So what do we learn about Christ? In the beginning was the word. He's the cosmic creator, and his glory fills the heavens. He's also the good creator. He made this universe a good and fitting home. And yet he took on our flesh, and he bore our sins, and in that, we see his grace. And it's the ultimate outpouring of his self-giving love, which turns around, and then that is God's true glory. And this is why I fall in love with Jesus Christ all over again every time I remember the cross besides the cosmos, the incredible, vast, beautiful, abundant, flourishing universe God made, in which I am such a tiny part, and yet, Christ came to walk among us, to show us the way to the Father, to forgive my sins, and to love me and show me his grace. The only proper response to this is worship. So will you join me in singing?